Big Big Seminar. Today we are very glad to have Professor Arthur Chung to give us a, a fish talk. And Arthur is an old friend of ERL and he was also the co-founder, uh, one of the co-founder of the ERL. And uh, now he is a professor Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, specializing in petroleum geosciences at the National University of Singapore. And uh, now he was also he is also an adjunct professor in the Earth System Science Programming at the Univers Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, he is a co-founder with Professor Jun Yue at Li of the Sustainable sustainability geophysics project. And prior to taking his current position, he was senior manager for uh, acoustics and uh, borehole seismic at uh, Halliburton Technologies. And uh, he has uh, a lot of publications over like uh, 130 papers and uh, holds like 25 patents. And uh, he was also a co-author for two books on borehole acoustics. Right now, he is uh, actually currently an uh, assistant editor for Geophysics and uh, the vice chair of the SEG Foundation Board of direct, uh, Directors. He received the Life Membership Award from SEG in 2013 and uh, the Distinguished Tec Technical Achievement Award from STWLA in 2015 and uh, the SPE Formation Evaluation Award in 2016 and the Honorable Membership Award from the SEG in 2021. And today, Arthur will give us a talk with the title of Modeling the Stress depend Dependence of Rock Properties, a Framework for a Unified Rock Physics Model. Let's welcome Arthur. Thank you, Silong. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to, uh, give a fish seminar again. And uh, great to see all the faces, you know, some of our old friends like Mike Failer and Tom Herring, you know, the, know each other for four, over 40 years now. <laughs> and, and then some of the new ones. And I'm personally glad to see uh, uh, Haiku and Joseph, who are in the other 12, 12 hours out. Joseph is still in uh, Singapore, uh, working for Hollywood in Singapore. He just graduated from our program last year and Haiku, is a joint student that Elita has with uh, Sing Ding Fang from the South University, Southern University of Hong Kong. I guess these graduate students and 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 young people they they stay up late. So <laughs> this is although it's midnight for them, they uh, it's still early. So so glad to see them and see other students at EIL. So uh, this is uh, something that I. I've been thinking about work and, and doing, trying to work on for, for years. Uh, 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 for those who know me, uh, knows that this come out really from, from my thesis research. So let me just share the screen first. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let me, this and okay. So you guys see the slides, right? Hopefully, uh, I need to to rearrange my desktop a little bit. Okay, so we are the sustainability geophysics project. We used to be called the Singapore Geophysics Project since, but since Elita and I are both leaving Singapore towards the end of the year. So we, we think we, we change our name to something that's more relevant to what we're doing. So as a matter of fact, we both are not working that much on petroleum related uh, geophysics, but uh, on, on things that are more sustainable and uh, on the more fundamental geophysics. So, yeah, <laughs> I learned, learned, learned all the fancy tricks on, uh, on PowerPoint. <laughs> so might as well use it. So today we're going to talk about the modern stress dependence of the rock properties, really a framework for, for unified uh, rock physics model. 
uh, you know, those of you who know me from a long time back knew my, my thesis at MIT was modeling the velocity uh, changes as a function of applied pressure. So this is really a, a continuation of my work, you know, after 40 years, if you, if you will. Uh, so, and a lot of work I, I, I'll, I'll say up front on, on the simulation work uh, was done by Joseph, who is now, uh, who's, and, and that's part of his thesis and he's, uh, he's now at Holliburton, Singapore. So we're going to talk about the outline that we talked today and we talked about introduction. You can look at the, the classical model to look at the, the, the press stress dependence of rocks, of the rock properties, a contact model, can the pseudo inclusion model, and then what I propose as a much better one for a unified rock physics model is the rock surface model. So this is something that ever since I got to MIT close to 50 years ago now, 73, we know about that this particular set of data is from Carl Coiner in 1985. Uh, David Johnston, who is my uh, contemporary at MIT did basically a very similar set of data, except that uh, I don't have any digital version of that data. So I keep showing uh, the, 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 the data from, from Carl, which, Carl Coiner, which is 1985, which uh, we have a digital version of. Basically, so if you, in this case, our favorite sandstone, barrier sandstone, the change in velocity as a function of applied pressure. If the pressure, right, for those who are not used to looking at this thing, is really, the confining pressure minus the pore pressure. So you can see the velocities, whether it's water saturated sandstone or benzene saturated or dry, they all increase significantly with pressure up to about, I would say four to 500 bars, which is four to 40 to 50 megapascal. And then it gets kind of flatter now. And if you increase the pore pressure, the effective pressure decreases and you, the trend line is going down the other way. So a lot of the problems that we are facing with uh, going forward, whether it's re-injection of wastewater or injecting CO2 into aquifer, uh, you're basically looking at increasing the pore pressure. And as a result, the, the change in velocity we expect is is uh, going the, the other way. We'll see a larger change in, in, in uh, velocities uh, because we have injecting pressure into the you know, rock formation. Con you know, in contrast, given the reservoir, if you just withdraw pressure, you're increasing the, the effective pressure. And at those reservoir pressures, if it increase, it's going up this way and you see a much less change. So by injecting something, we're seeing actually a larger change in the velocities and the rock properties. So this is P wave velocity. And you see the same thing in shear wave velocity. And right, these so are- Sorry to interrupt, but does it depend on the boundary conditions, whether the pressure can escape far away? Yeah. It, it always is a drain versus an undrained situation, right? But these are lab data and, and you're seeing uh, what's going on and what, what you're thinking about if you inject something and in, in, in the, within the volume, pressure is not going, going to decrease or escape uh, uh, immediately, right? You have a, a locally increased uh, pressure pocket. So you're going to see these changes in a row. Thanks, so the, yeah, the interesting thing is, it's one of the things that, that that's very interesting and how, we have observed it for forever. And the oil guys totally usually just ignore this part is the shear wave 
velocity actually changes with water saturation. Okay. And the interesting part, of course, there's a flip going from low effective pressure to high effective pressure uh, in terms of what is faster, dry rock or water. At high pressure, the, hot, the shear velocity tends to be higher because the effective density, uh, you, you're looking at basically the effective density effect going from water to, to, to dry. Whereas at the lower effective pressure, uh, what comes into play are the uh, contact points and what we like to call cracks. Okay. So these kind of data are just, uh, uh, you can pull this type of data just above from uh, anywhere. You know, we did quite a few of these kind of data set at MIT, Stanford, rock physics group uh, in old days also have uh, quite a bit of these. So there's no question about these kind of behavior. Okay, so, so more recently, this is in 2011, uh, Tong Ching Han, currently now he is at uh, uh, CUPB in, uh, in, in Qing, Qingdao. So he did measurement. So P wave velocity we've seen before, the same thing. But what's different is on the same sample under the same condition simultaneously, he measures the resistivity. There you go. And the resistivity shows a very similar trend. And, and remember, this is the same sample measuring at the same time. So you can see identical pressure conditions, differential pressure conditions. So we'll, that's a one to one relationship. So, and both of them can be basically approximated by a decaying exponential. Okay. So that's interesting. But what more interesting in his paper is he just did not measure one or two or three samples. He measured a collection of 60 something samples. These are not specially chosen samples. These are things that uh, he managed to get his hands on. So every one single one of this, you see this color, uh, 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 each different color represent a single sample. There are six pressure points, right? The important things to notice is not only the Velocity versus resistivity has a relationship, but the trend line as a function of pressure also. You see the higher the resistivity, you see a corresponding higher velocity, but the cold variation with pressure is also steeper. So now, we, there, up to now, there has not been a good theory to explain why we're seeing this, right? Why are you seeing this trend line? So I hope that's what we've been working on. I hope what I show you today will say, you will say at the end of the day, yeah, that makes sense. So that we are seeing modeling these changes. And, and it's a framework for trying to, 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 to model this, right? So that's what we're trying to do. I, I'm going to go through a little bit uh, review of my uh, of existing models and what their uh, drawbacks are. The classical models, especially coming from uh, high porosity uh, sandstone uh, type of reservoirs, they tend to talk about contacts, sand grains in contact. So one of the favorite models is the hertz minden model. You go, this is try to estimate the effective dry bulk models of a two identical sphere packing. So you push a stress onto two spheres, you compress them, you end up with a, a contact area. 
QA. And basically, your bug modulus is of this form. This is C is a coordination number. Basically, it's telling you how many of these contacts uh, per unit volumes are. Uh, v is porosity. This is the bug modulus. This is the Poisson's ratio. And this is the applied pressure. So it's the pressure to the one third dependent. And if you look at the effective shear modulus, right, identical shear packing with small tangential force applied, the shear modulus is of this form. Once again, the important part to look at is pressure to the one third. Okay. So for both buck and shear moduli, the pressure dependence is P to one third. Now, if I plot the bug modulus versus effective pressure in a log linear, a linear log plot, what I see the same uh, coiner data looking something like that. Yeah, I see pretty much I can fit a straight line to it. Okay. And the line is actually quite, 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 quite straight. But the slope is a little different when you're looking at dry rock versus saturated rock. Same thing for shear. Okay, the slopes are a bit different for the water saturated, for the benzene, and for the dry. Okay. So what data is telling you is the logrammatic stress dependence appear to be a reasonable approximation. However, the different rates apply to bulk and shear moduli and dry and saturated rock. So when you do a fluid substitution, you're actually changing also the rate of dependence and stress dependence. And some, some way we need to take into account, take that into account, right? So again, what we have known for a long time, a simple Gassman type of fluid substitution will not work over the entire pressure range simply because it says that shear wave modulus doesn't change under, under changing in, fluid, in, in uh, different fluids, which is actually not the case. And you can see that, uh, that uh, from the uh, from the shear wave modulus data uh, that we have here, so this actually the shear wave moduli change with pressure and saturation. Okay. So what does that mean to the pore space, and how does one tie it to other physical properties? Especially, especially, there is no easy way to calculate the conductive path in this model for resistivity and or for permeability calculations. So we go to the other, oops, we go, the other type of models, which is coming from the other side, instead of modeling the, the sand grains in contact, we're lot more trying to model the pore space. And, you know, I being from MIT, and this is the 70s, 60s and 70s, following the work of Joe Walsh, among others, we tend to think in terms of ellipsoidal inclusions. And my immediate predecessor at MIT uh, was yeah, Guy Cousteau. And of course, uh, some of you know the, the Guy the Cousteau and Toxox model that is very commonly used up there. And I, I, I work on that, my thesis was based on that. So let's see what we can do with ellipsoidal inclusions. So, the, this is Hans' uh, 1986 empirical relationship. This is one of the papers really people quote a lot in uh, rock physics, especially from, from uh, uh, from the uh, high porosity rocks. So he did Sally Shandstone 70 sample also. He, he, he did the very uh, earlier versions. This is a different Han. This is Steha Han who just retired from U of H. 
And uh, so, so it's, it's a little confusing sometimes with the same Han, Han last name, but uh, uh, so he has these relationships at different pressure, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 megapascals, what the per velocity, porosity dependence are, okay? So clay is the clay volume, P, P is the porosity. So I want you to focus on these two terms, basically the zero intercept terms, okay? The zero porosity and zero clay volume intercepts really should represent the solid matrix property, if you think about it, right? If you take away the, por uh, the clay, take away the porosity, what you left with are the rocks. But you look at it, there is at five megapascal, the VP is quite a, a, a significantly lower than at 40 megapascal. And so does the VS. VS is about 10%, VP is slightly less than 10%. Uh, so the decrease in the zero intercept velocity, and that's the model line, with decreasing pressure is an indication of the role of the cracks play. And these effects are not modeled by a simple photometric relationship with porosity and our clay volume. Okay, so we are basically thinking about how do we model that? I mean, because this is, this is what we end up thinking about. How do you model these changes as a function of pressure? We're not thinking about the porosity changes or clay changes because these are not going to change much with pressure, right? A crack are what changes with pressure, okay? So in the pseudo pore modeling, as I mentioned, the uh, pressure effect, you know, this is, uh, yeah, but has to bear with me, this is, this is stuff that I, I worked with uh, literally over 40 years ago during my, my, my thesis. So I go a quick review of what, what we did back then and what we're doing now. So the pressure effect model by closing a small aspect ratio cracks. And the smaller aspect ratio crack closes at lower pressure, et cetera, right? The rate is proportional to the frame compressibility. So when you have increasing pressure, you have a big ellipsoid, it goes to, becomes a smaller ellipsoid, a flatter ellipsoid, and ultimately a, a really flat ellipsoid and then disappear. So the way we, we calculate this is the fractional change in porosity around ellipsoid is, is a constant strain field, in the constant strain field, sorry about the, 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 the typo. So the fractional change is, is a constant strain. When you apply, this is only true if you have a ellipsoid. You apply the pressure, there's an a applied strain and there's a relationship given by the SOP formulation. This is 1957, uh, all, the, all the ellipsoidal papers you see basically are from the SOP formulation. Now, in you know, a limit of a penny-shaped crack, meaning vanishing small aspect ratio, very thin crack, Walsh, Joe Walsh developed this uh, relationship. Okay, so we have a change in porosity with pressure that is basically related to crack porosity and aspect ratio. For uh, O-blaze spheroid, the pore volume is given by basically crack porosity is four pi, pi alpha R cube. And, and you assume the radius does not change with under, change much under pressure, then basically a fractional change in porosity is equal to the fractional change in the aspect ratio of the crack. All right, so you increase the pressure, you go, go smaller and smaller. So that's the idea behind all that. So when we have the velocity, we can invert the porosity at these different pressures for the, what we call the pore aspect ratio spectrum, which is how fat the crack is initially at zero pressure. 
And as it go, go, go up in pressure, it gets smaller and smaller and finally vanished. And so with both wet and dry, we can fit that curve. VPVS uh, predictions is uh, quite nicely. And from there, you can get a spectrum of the, uh, what the crack looks like. These are the uh, circle cracks, these are the uh, non-circle but slightly fat crack, and these are the really thin cracks on there. And this have predictive power because you can take just the wet data, for example, and invert it for the spectrum and use it to predict the dry data and it works quite well. And you can go do it the other way around, which is take the dry data, invert it for spectrum and predict the wet data. And that works quite well. So now you ask me, what is the problem? What are the limitations? Well, first one is isotropic because the model is isotropic. But this is actually the question that Ted asked me, Ted Madden asked me during my thesis defense. This is a critical question. This is a long interacting model. So we cannot predict permeability of them there. So, and it has limit in modeling with Sistivia. It People have used ellipsoidal models to measure resistivity, but in general, you cannot measure easily model resistivity using this model. Okay. And the ellipsoidal model, of course, are the stiffest possible for a given porosity. You can think about, you know, I keep saying porosity, a sphere is the stiffest thing, but any kind of other ellipsoidal pores are also stiffest for a given uh, aspect ratio. Okay. So what are we going to use? We're going to use a rough surface model. At the end of the day, on this, you think about it, both the contact model, ellipsoidal inclusion model can model certain aspects of the rough physics. But we know there's only one realization, if you will, of the rock, right? It has a pore space and it has the grains. And we make our measurements of resistivity, permeability, and velocity on this piece of rock. The model, we need to have a model to be able to predict, let us predict all this behavior. And right now, the existing, you know, classical models fail in that uh, regard. Now, you might say, can I use digital rocks? Yeah, sure, you can use digital rocks. And even digital rocks have limitations because of resolution. It can predict the flows quite well, resistivity quite well, but the elastic behavior is also still uh, a work to be uh, uh, in progress. More, more importantly, you're taking a, a realization of rock and just run the experiment without truly understanding the true physics behind it. Okay, and, and I think this is what we're trying to do, uh, build a model with fewer parameters that but represent the physics. And I think a rough surface model uh, really uh, can work. So, Rough surface models, and, and there have been a number of rough surface models. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't see Steve uh, in the audience, but uh, Steve Brown has been the one who's done uh, quite a bit of this in this area. Uh, Walsh and Grosenbach, this is in the 1970s, my contemporary. Steve Brown and Chris Schultz, Tony Ganges, Bed of Nails model and many, many, many others. So mo most of them focus on the flow and the static deformation. Really not much work has been give, done on the dynamic elastic properties. And what I'm gonna tell you a little bit is how we're gonna model 
the dynamic elastic properties. So we focus on integrating flow, electromagnetic, and dynamic elastic behavior into this unified model as a function of pressure. That's a key part. We're, we're not just doing a, at a single pressure. We're doing it as a function of pressure. So by specifying the statistical distribution of the roughness of the surface, we can deterministically calculate the permeability, resistivity, and velocity, or as a function of pressure. So as I said, you know, uh, the work uh, is done mostly by Joseph as part of his thesis. And uh, so you can also talk to him afterwards uh, at, uh, and he's been working on this for, for a few years. So some of these ideas that came from also from Steve Brown and we borrowed some, some of the codes from uh, Peter Kang, you know, uh, our colleagues at MIT and we're trying to put together uh, in the different ways have been doing it. So this is uh, a rough fracture uh, shown by, by Steve. There's an implicit linkage between the fluid flow and elastic properties through rough fractures, right? The contact area you see here gives you the stiffness of the fracture. The non-contact surfaces give you the compliance of the fracture. The height of the openings gives you the flow conductivity both for the uh, elastic, I mean the electromagnetic and, and, and fluid flow. Okay. Pressure, when you have pressure, you increase its contact points, contact area, reduces the non-contact area and reduces the aperture height. So the relationship in the reduction of aperture height does the change in, in flow. Flow of electricity and fluids is related to the change in the velocities, which are from the compliance through the distribution, height distribution. Okay, so that's where you can link two together. So this is simulation uh, based on single rough fracture model. You apply a pressure, this is the cube, fluid in, fluid out, this is a rough surface. We typically use a flat upper surface and a distribution lower surface and Steve Frank has shown that you can do that. So, a model like that is simple. We need three parameters to characterize the initial fracture aperture distribution. We have the autocorrelation length. We have the standard deviation of the first contact aperture sigma. And we have the mean aperture. And that's it. We characterize that, that rough surface. Pressure leads to a uniform compression of displacement of delta. So one of the key is what is the relationship between P and Delta. How do we calculate that? So the relationship between the applied vertical stress and the fracture compression is based on Giroux's work and Unger and Mies. This gives you the static compression model. It doesn't give you the velocity. It gives you the static compression. And you can have an effective pressure versus compression displacement. So now, I can relate how much displacement I have on the surface to how much uh, applied pressure here. Okay. So now we, we show the interesting thing. So we, we have an initial aperture, flat surface, a rough, quite obviously blown up uh, scale, uh, rough surface. So you see now, as we apply the pressure, you know, changes in load on there, we see the white part, which are the parts in contact growing bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? The color part, the color gets darker because you look at this color scale, the height of the aperture gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is a, a realization of how pressure compression uh, is related to your 
distribution of the asperity height and contact area. So this is basically with this, we can go ahead and calculate all the things you want need to calculate. So that's the critical part of, of this simulation. So flow Arthur, simulation. How, how, huh? Arthur, how do the, how do the <clears throat> characteristics <clears throat> of this depend on the, uh, I assume you have some statistical distribution yeah. of the fractional care of the characteristics. Uh, yeah. I assume that's a critical parameter. That is the critical I mean, use, parameter, yeah. Okay, so like if you use a power law, it's the slope of the power law. You know, the, it's, it's so, let's see, go back here. What's that? So you have an autocorrelation length and, uh, and uh, distribution. So if you, actually that's a, that's a young lady over in uh, Ruben, group uh, uh, and, and uh, you, you chill. And she, in her, <clears throat> in her bachelor's thesis at Jilin University, before she came over to MIT, uh, she actually measured the roughness of some rock and actually estimate what the, the autocorrelation and standard deviation mean aperture is. So we actually have, uh, uh, some simulation of her work too. Well, while but, you're, but at least thinking of scattering, you know, uh, we we define scattering and 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 those characteristics also and look at weight propagation, mm -hmm. but but it also mm -hmm. depends on like whether you use a Gaussian distribution or yeah. a, a power yeah. law distribution, and 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 and, and, and yeah. weight propagation that's critical. It makes a huge difference. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I assume. Yeah. My, the, okay, sorry. In this, it doesn't make a huge difference. But I, uh, I think we have a lot normal distribution if I uh, uh, remember correctly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask, while you're stopped, can I just ask a, also a, or a more basic question? How, how, what formula is leading to this animation on, on the previous slide? Is it, what is this, formula? Yeah, is this, is, is, is this uh, a, a numerical simulation of flow? This is or? numerical simulation of this. Uh, we, Basically, you're looking at this. Okay, yeah. Uh, you apply effective pressure. That's the compression, and 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 once you compress the with the static distribution, you push it down, and you can recalculate uh, how many points are in contact. This is a very simple simulation. That's why I keep saying this is a framework. You just come up, come down this this basement. You start cutting cutting it off. We actually had a more complex uh, simulation. Uh, Peter Kang has a more complex simulation and we, you know, we can use that. But it turns out it doesn't really make that much difference in terms of uh, uh, getting the meshes across. So you, so you basically, you generate the surface by some random process and then you apply right. the formula at each point. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, you just basically, at a given stress, you, you know the delta from the Giroux formula, and you come in and basically push down on the, uh, start cutting off the uh, uh, distribution. Okay, I see now, thanks. Yeah. It's a fairly straightforward thing. So, so it, it's just testing the idea of how, how well this works. So the fluid flow, the steady state fluid flow model is very simple. Uh, uh, Steve has been using it for, for a while. Uh, you know, Stasi's law, simple. And, and uh, local permeability related aperture type, yes, uh, basic H, high square divided by 12, Tony Genji's uh, work. And, and the effective permeability of the, of the rock is evaluated, doesn't want to say it, from outgoing volumetric fluid flow rate, okay. So the key is, I think a lot of the things that is also shown by uh, Peter Kang over the years is when you put, when you have a rough distribution and you put pressure on it, the hydraulic gradient is from a uniform to become fairly non-uniform. Okay, you can see as you apply pressure, uh, uh, the hydraulic gradient uh, basically you can see from a fairly uniform distribution going to, to a, a less uniform distribution is higher up here. 
then down here, the flow tends to get, get go up uh, in this way. And you can visualize it also looking at the volumetric flow rate from this simulation, right? And these are the contact area, no, no flow in there. And the flow path slowly start going more, more up here. Actually, this one goes, goes down this way. So you can see how, how it becomes non-uniform and it changes okay, and decreases. So with that, you can calculate a permeability versus effective pressure. I think this last couple of points is uh, are more numerical because we don't have uh, enough, uh, find enough uh, points or whatnot. But in general, you see this general trend going through. Resistivity. We do the current model by 2D Ohm's law. Right. I mean, once again, uh, Steve did that. Uh, so this is really not very new. It's the current versus the voltage and you have a fluid conductance perm, a rock conductance term. And the electrical resist resistance evaluate from a total uh, outgoing current. Okay. And, and then you have the resistivity of the rock uh, which takes the geometry into, into uh, account. Okay, so electrical potential, basically same, same story as the hydraulic uh, head and it changes as a function of pressure. It's no longer uniform through, through, the, through the fracture when you have pressure through it. And with that, the electrical conductive path changes too. Notice because the relationship is a little different, the electrical conductive path is not identical to the uh, hydro hydraulic flow path. Okay, the physics is a little different, the, the results are a little different. And we have a resistivity versus pressure. Yeah, okay. Now, the, the important part we we'll get to, which is the velocity modeling. The conventional modeling uses a contact area and apply the Hertz minimum type of uh, models to calculate increase in the contact stiffness and the number area contact increases with pressure. We decide to go the other way. We decide to take a different approach. We model the lawn contact area using the classical wash penny shaped crack approximation. If we take the fracture surface as a whole as one, the crack density of one, the crack density, as you change your pressure, it's just the fraction of the surface not in contact, okay? And it's approximation, no question about that. We can use any number of crack density model based on the uh, base model to calculate velocity. However, since I'm part of this, <laughs> research, I, we use my model in 1993, basically because it, it uses a Padé approximation and can handle a much larger uh, crack density. So this is what we use uh, uh, with the uh, Padé approximation for large crack density. And so the interesting thing is you, the previous work focuses on the dark area where the contact increases and calculate the increase in the stiffness of the fracture by looking at a contact area. We are taking a different approach. We are looking at the yellow area, which is the open area. And as it decreases, it also decreases the compliance of the, of the fracture. Okay, so we, we are looking at that. Uh, from, from that angle. So this is what we get in VP. Very reasonable increase in uh, VP as a function of pressure. And this is a shear wave. Because as you know, shown before, the, the model, crack density model, you can, I can predict C44 and C, C33 and C44, which are the 
the P wave modulus and she wave modulus measured vertically. So now this is the interesting part. Oh, this is the permeability versus PVP. You know, this tells you from permeability decreases in this frac crack dominated system, decreases as you increase the velocity. This is the, now if I show you, remind you what I've shown you before, which is the P wave velocity from Han, this is the, the young Han data and the resistivity on the same rock. Okay. And now I show you from the simulation over the same range of pressure. This is what I got has a very similar shape to it, okay? And if I plot for one single rock, velocity resistivity as an effective pressure is actually fairly linear behavior on that. And that's kind of expected because of the behavior of, the, of this particular distribution, okay? But the most important, the most interesting thing is, can we, so the resistivity, it depends on height of the aperture, velocity depends on non-contact area. The specific relationship depends on the statistical distribution of the roughness of the fracture, right? The interesting thing is going back to this data set, the complete data set, can we measure somewhat this kind of behavior? Right. So one thing we need to do is what is our uh, high pressure behavior of our proposed rock. So this is a field realization, the apparent formation factor at 60 megapascal, right? This is a range of model we created uh, basically from a very standard uh, formation factor for this versus with, uh, resistivity model. And they are for three different sigmas. You can sigma change a little bit, but doesn't really change what the basic relationship is. So this is a very similar, simple relationship, almost linear between formation factor and, and uh, velocity at 60 megapascal. Now with this background, we ran the simulation. And we get a set of simulations that looking like this. And these three of them is different sigma on there. And you can see it doesn't really make a lot of difference on the sigma for this particular situation. But you see basically the same trend that these dependence get steeper as you get higher resistivity and higher velocity. If I flip it back to the actual data, you can basically the, the numbers are not identical, but the trend is, right? Through back and forth, you see the trend. So we think that we are at least model some of the fundamentals involved. The details, of course, needs a lot of work. So one more, one more things that we can do, this is in Hans paper, what he did was taking this equation and basically estimate this slope and plot resistivity against this slope. They call it G1, the joint rate gradient. And this is what he, he obtained. Interestingly, that slope, the G1, plot against resistivity is very much a straight line. This is 60 of some, six, 60 odd, uh, sandstones with, with different amount of clays on it. So the fact that you actually can pull it on a straight line will tell you something uh, about the property of the pore space, right? And in our model, if we do that, we also get straight lines. And the straight lines shift a bit depending on what the sigma uh, of, the, of the model is. Okay, so what we have today 
want to, to come convey to you is stress dependence is the integral part of rock physics, right? It really holds the key to understanding a different physical property in a unified manner. What we presented is just a really a framework with first order and sometimes zero order approximations for the calculation of properties. And a lot of it needs more development. And, and I think some, some of you, well, I'm not sure, I can't see whether Steve is recording or not. Uh, this is a topic I talked with Steve for a long time. And finally got a, got a student, Joseph, to work on it a bit. And I think we have some interesting results for the moment. And, uh, but interesting, this framework can handle anisotropy and the 2D right now, the 2D model and 2D to 3D is possible with the older fabric tensor approach. Okay, so that's all I have. I welcome your feedback and questions. Okay, thanks Arthur for such a great talk. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, um, I thought it was very interesting. And I, I just want to clarify, when you were flipping back between the slides from Han 2011 and, and your current result, the different colors on his slides were just different samples. Yeah. And yeah. different uh, curves on your slides, did they have properties corresponding to those samples? That was that was no, quite fast no, not really. Yeah. So we just know that there's a range of variability. Yeah, for, exactly. Yeah. For each specimen, the slope is, the, yeah. the 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 rotation of the slope is similar, also. Yeah, yeah. The increase in slope as you as you go up. Right, there, right. Yeah. To uh, I guess it was higher resistivity. Mm -hmm. So I mean that that would be the next thing to check, right? Would be if if you try to include the properties of those specimens to really get a correspondence or 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 do we think is is that would that be the next thing to do is try to really match up well that that's one of the next things to do there are many other things next things oh, yeah. to do on from this easy. you <laughs> yeah. have to build each success step by step and that seems sort of yeah i hate to use the phrase low hanging fruit but yeah I wanted to ask also, um, I used to work in, in turbulence and, and part of the progress in turbulence came from these really heroic simulations where you would get a, a supercomputer and compute something directly with no, with as little approximation as you could for you know thousands of hours and just create these data sets based on the, the physical understanding. We, we know the equations of the continuum for solids and fluids and the, all, all these things could be done, I think, couldn't they be done with very high precision on a, on a very expensive, but you know, not a, a computation which would be run once or twice to create um, a high fidelity physics simulation. Has that ever been done? I mean, because all these models, people do a lot of approximations out of necessity. I, I think, I think, I think the, the answer to that is partly, I think the digital rock world, they've done some very, very good yeah. simulation on the flows. Okay, mostly permeability. I think resistivity is a little more difficult for various reasons. Uh, uh, I'm sure Dale knows all the, <laughs> some of the difficulties in simulation. And, and elastic is very difficult because it, we actually, the crack scale, you, you don't actually, if you think about aspect ratio crack of 10 to a minus three, that's the thousand to one. And you need huge model to be able to do that. And in general, you can't capture that, that, that level of detail. There are many other ways to talk, think about it. And, and one of the things that the reason we, we, we're looking at this kind of approach is see whether there is kind of a fractal behavior that you can, you can just approximate, you know, the, the finer cracks with, uh, uh, with a distribution, right? And so you can estimate those from, uh, if, you, if you think about it, if I can think uh, a distribution like this works to some extent, I can maybe go to a digital rock picture and extract the distribution of the roughnesses 
can calculate from there. Yeah. So, so I've always wanted to do really uh, one of my favorite things to say is we make all these measurements and, and in the petrophysics world, they all just use one number, porosity. And can we add a couple of different numbers to the porosity term to allow us to calculate some of these things? And, and this is one of the, the, the attempts we're doing, adding in some kind of roughness distribution to, to the porosity term to model certain behavior. Yeah. Arthur, can you give me your thoughts on um, whether you think it would be feasible to relate seismic slip as an induced seismicity to changes in permeability? I mean, I assume by <laughs> your model, it would be somehow related to the correlation length. But, you know, I mean, when we see, you know, people have reported that they see changes in permeability. You know, Cooper Basin in Australia, they claim that the permeability increased in the direction orthogonal to slip. And, you know, I know Steve's thought about this, and I need to get back to Steve and ask him for his more recent thoughts. But do you do you do you think there's any hope in that in that topic? And does your model oh. provide any direction on that? No, I I think certainly uh, I think I think they are related. How 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 can we model it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're working on some CO2 data where there's, yeah. there was no evidence of faults in, a, um, in 3D seismic in the area where the earthquakes occurred. But then the earthquakes occurred in areas that appeared to align along faults. Mm -hmm. And the question is, were those just pre-existing faults that were really tight? Or is the permeability increasing along those faults as they slip? And, and that's why they're, these faults are growing. And, and so this becomes kind of a real question is, you know, Josimer's trying to model this. And I mean, he's trying to, but he's doing a poor geomechanical model. Um, and he's just, you know, assuming some permeability along the faults. And, and the question is, can we come up with any reasonable numbers based on estimates of seismic slip? I, uh, I really don't know, but I, I just know that uh, there are people working on the, the geomechanical aspects of it, how, how, how they can how they change the static deformation of the rock properties. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's one thing. I mean, I mean, I yeah. assume that you get changes in pore pressure and changes in pore elastic stress that could influence your permeability. Yeah. yeah. But then does the slip change does the slip change it also? Um, it will will definitely change it because it once you slip, you change the stress state, you you change all kinds yeah. of things. <laughs> yeah. I, I had another question. Um, this is even further out, but has anyone tried to do sort of a statistical mechanical approach where the distribution, you, you would generate these surfaces by a, a distribution based somehow energetically on what the distribution, what the surface implies for the energy of the system? Um, not that I'm aware well of. I mean, I'm, I don't claim I, I, I read all the literature <laughs> associated with this, yeah. I, I, I suggest it just because it's, it's a way to try to connect the physics and the randomness. You know, uh, years ago, if you recall, the people would generate these random surfaces and just have parameters that weren't that closely connected to the physics. And I, I was thinking about this as a way to yeah. bring those two approaches together. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, the, I don't know who's doing it. And, it is a really complex question on, on term, what are these roughnesses, right? I mean, we, we have looked at, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Ruben's stu current student have, you know, in, in her undergraduate, they had, had actually done the Brazilians uh, splitting uh, on, on the fractures on the, on, a, on the piece of granite and actually measured the roughness of the uh, that generated, but that's, uh, and, and this looks like similar to what we, we have uh, been simulating, but then that's only one version of reality, right? I mean, there are other ways 
uh, these roughnesses have been generated uh, over the year, uh, right? over geological time or whatnot, right? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But one thing I, I just want to keep showing my MIT bias <laughs> it is, uh, I think, I think Dale knows very well. It's just because I, I, I did my, uh, I learned my rock physics at MIT. So, so I tend to think about fractal surfaces, uh, you know, uh, ellipsoidal cracks and, 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 and roughnesses from that standpoint. Uh, you, you know, people who have done some of this, in, in, you know, historically have been, uh, uh, Steve is at MIT now, but uh, I guess when he was at Lamont, his, his advisor is Chris Schultz, who came, also came from MIT. So we tend to think along that way versus the, the, the green boundary, the green contact approach, uh, which from the, come from the really higher porosity, uh, ocean sediment type bottling approach. So I think, I think for, for, for pressure dependence, I believe this works better. This approach works better of pressure dependence. I'm biased, of course. I <laughs> Is there a good textbook that sort of en en encompasses all these things? All these you know, reviews, all this? I've only seen a bunch of papers. Well, to... there is the the, the 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 Bible we call it in the in, in, in this world, in rock physics world, the, the Gary Mavko's handbook. Rock yeah. physics handbook, but it's more of a handbook rather yeah. than discussing, you know, which what is applicable to what. I mean, so you want to form a form, you want to find a formula is in there, but then, right. yeah, I have it. <laughs> so, any additional questions? If there's no additional questions, let's do well. I have uh, one, one more. Yeah, okay. yeah. I have just one go more. Ahead, go, go. One more announcement for those interested in this. Uh, 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 the student, uh, Yelita, and my, my, actually both more Yelita student, my student, uh, Yunnan, has just, we just published a JGR paper last week uh, on. 3D reconstruction uh, of uh, digital rock images that might be of interest for some, some of you guys. Okay, thanks, Arthur. Uh, see you next time. Okay, take care, Bye. you guys. Stay safe. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Arthur. Bye. Bye.